So I think it's incredibly important that when we are thinking about athlete development, we have to create the right culture and the right environment for them to develop in. So even in an individual sport like table tennis, an athlete needs someone to play against, but they also need more than that. They need a group of people who are constantly pushing them to get better. What we do know about practice from researchers like Anders Ericsson and stuff is that people, you, you get better when you are constantly at the edge of your comfort zone. When you are, you know, just above, you just can't quite do it and you're constantly striving to get better and better and better. Well, what happens if you have a young athlete who's the only one and you're training him or you're training her and they're not being pushed by their peers, then they start falling out of their comfort zone. Across sports, we can do a lot of things differently, right? We can um, have kids play against older kids. We can have kids play against stronger kids. But I think one of the most important things is creating that correct type of culture, that correct environment with lots of athletes, and then being patient in it. Because we really don't know until after people stop growing, after they're done with puberty, what kind of athlete they're going to be at that next level. And so if we're in too much of a hurry to say with really, really young kids, you know, age eight, age nine, age 10, yes, these are the ones we're gonna give all the training to them and we're not gonna train the others. It really ignores the fact of, well, what makes people good? And, and that's sustained effort over time, that's motivation, that's all these different things. So I think it's really, really important, especially for coaches working with very young athletes, that we, we train as many kids as possible, right, for as long as possible. We create the best environment possible and, and then we see after they grow who comes out of that environment. That's the best way to develop athletes, not try to predict the future by picking the one or two and only training them. How to approach parents, how to sell this to them. One of the things I think is most important with parents is that just because it worked for someone else doesn't mean that that'll work for your kid, right? We can look at golf and say, oh, look what Tiger Woods did in golf. Uh, so I need to be like Earl Woods, but that was Tiger Woods. Or the tennis, the Williams sisters. Oh, look what Richard Williams did. But every athlete and every person is different and they need something different. So hey, you know, you have to know your own kids. Number two, what we do know from, from research, uh, there's a sports scientist out of Canada named Joe Baker and he says that the three primary ingredients of athletic success over time is enjoyment, ownership and intrinsic motivation. And so as a parent, you should always be asking yourself, is my son or my daughter enjoying this, right? Does this experience belong to them? Do they have autonomy? Are we chasing after their goals and their passions or are they my goals and my passions? Because if they're mine, she or he will eventually give up. And then from those things comes intrinsic motivation. That's the fuel. It doesn't matter how fast or how strong or how much talent any athlete has, if they do not have that internal, that intrinsic drive to practice and get better and keep going and, and get through the difficult parts and get through injuries and all those things, it doesn't matter. They're going to walk away, they're going to quit, or they're never going to reach that. So I think as parents, if you always keep your eye on that, right, is my athlete enjoying this? Is this their goals? Is this do they own this? And and is the motivation coming from within inside? And how do we promote internal motivation? Then then that's the best thing you can do as a parent. Not force kids to do it. Now I also think as a parent, you can talk to your kids, and one of the things they can learn from sport is commitment. So when they make a commitment to work with a coach for a year, or to be uh, on a team, or maybe they are signing a contract with a national team, and they they've made that commitment. As a parent, you can say you made the commitment, fulfill your commitment. And, and I think that's one of the strongest things that parents can come in and say, help kids fulfill their commitment, and then also say, hey, you had goals, you wrote these goals down, how can I help you to achieve your goals? Not my goals, but your goals. And I think those are the biggest things parents can do. I have watched that. Yeah. So most of our it's very free to continue to be a professional Around 18, it's a cut age. Mm -hmm. Which major habits, or which strength did the person bring to being involved in a sport, in a collective sport, when I said collective, you know, mm -hmm. be part of the group mm -hmm. for the future? 
to what they bring to their life after it. So I think one of the things that sometimes we forget, especially when we're working with young kids, is we're only focused on the sporting aspect of what they're learning, right? Did we win? Did we advance? Did we make this team? Did we make the international team? And, and we forget that even an elite, elite level athlete, someone who's good enough to make a living playing the sport, is going to at least spend two thirds of their life not playing that sport. So they have to take these things that they learn from sport and be able to transfer them to life. So if we are raising athletes where we are making compromises to win, right? If we're raising athletes where we're protecting them from failure and or we have they have a difficult coach who's pushing them and we're saying, oh, we're gonna leave that coach and go to another coach who tells us what we wanna hear. What happens is you're trading short-term happiness or whatever for, for long-term life lessons. And I think what most athletes that I meet who played at the highest level and they come back and what they're grateful for is what sport taught them that they've been able to transfer to the rest of their life. And the ones that are really sad are the ones who were these sports stars and as soon as sport is gone, their life falls apart because their whole entire identity was about what a great tennis table player I was or what a great soccer player I was. And all of a sudden, they have no identity anymore. So making sure that sport is something that your kids do, not who they are, and then and then making sure that you, know, you cannot guarantee that you'll be a, an Olympic athlete or a professional athlete. But you can guarantee as a parent, if you're intentional about the sporting experience, if you find the right coaches, if you surround them with the right teammates and the right people, that sport's gonna teach them a lot of things that's gonna make them better people and, and make them more successful in the rest of their life. One of the things that, especially with young players, we, we see a lot, because it's a lot about repetition, repetition. But this can also kill creativity. Mm -hmm. How can coach recognize where is the line when I deal with the technical things, deal, deal with the skills, but at the same time I don't, don't kill that thing. How you see what are maybe the tricks and tips that the coach can recognize where is this line? We're always, as a coach, as an instructor, walking that line between um, creativity and, and saying, no, this is the way it has to be done. And I think it really depends upon sometimes the ages of kids we're working with. So there is a certain foundation to have a, a good swing or good technique in any sport, right? And and there are certain things that are really non-negotiable. So you can't be a soccer player and kick the ball with your toe. You have to learn to hit it with your laces. So as a coach, you have to step in and say, no, that is not the way to do that. There, This is the way to do that. We also have to make sure as coaches that we're not invasive. And what we are starting to learn from, from research is that um, what we call, uh, there, there's a scale of learning, explicit to implicit. And explicit learning would be rules-based learning, right? These are the five rules of, of uh, hitting a, a cut shot, or this is the five rules of um, how to chip a ball in golf. And then there's implicit learning, which is less rules-based and more sort of can I figure it out, right? How do I sort it? And what the research is starting to show us is that that people who learn things explicitly by the rules are much better at spitting it back to you as a coach and telling you how they did it, but it doesn't transfer as well to matches where they must make decisions on the fly and things have to happen automatically. So they're gonna revert back to, ooh, I, what shot am I gonna hit? And so um, one of our challenges as coaches is can we make learning more implicit? Can we say to kids, how would you solve that problem instead of this is how to solve that problem, right? And instead of saying, in that situation, hit this shot, you say, um, in that situation, what shot would you hit? Because when they start reverting to, well, I would hit this, well, why would you hit this? Okay, fair enough. And then maybe we say, would you maybe consider that this would be a way you could do it as well versus just you're wrong and I'm right. So the more research we, we get, the more we learn that, that the more implicit learning our environments can be, the more it looks like a match, the more it looks game-like, uh, the better it can be. 
in the table tennis world, I don't know if research has been done in this, but I know it's been done in soccer. I know it's been done in rugby. I know it's been done in, in basketball. I know it's been done where you, know, you can throw a player um, you know, over the course of a season and say shoot three pointers and they'll make 50% of their three pointers in practice, uh, but then their shooting percentage to game is 20% but they just made 2,000 at 50%, but in the game it's 20. Well, there's something wrong with your practice because it's not replicating what they're facing in the game. So I think any coach always has to walk that line of, does this look like the match? And if it doesn't look like the match, how can I make it more look more like the match so that this learning is more implicit? So when they see it in the match, they've seen that a thousand times before. Do you ever hit the same exact shot you know, a hundred times a row in a table tennis match? Well, should you hit it a hundred times in a row in practice? The research is starting to say, no, you shouldn't.